known words for three years, um, I had the same title. So the aim of the project and the book was to ask, what does scientific realism debate look like in the focused context of quantum physics? What becomes, the, what becomes of the key issues such as the problem of undetermination for scientific realism, or the idea that somehow inference of the best explanation provides an argument for scientific realism, what becomes of various realist moves to these challenges in the context of quantum mechanics. Now, in the book, various authors have their different views on the matter. I think if one wants to summarize what the upshot is at large, I think the um, take home message of the book is that scientific realism is much less straightforward a view to defend or hold in the context of quantum mechanics. And that really does create, create tensions in the realist philosophy, given that on the one hand, sci uh, scientific realism is extremely well motivated in the context of quantum mechanics, given its huge empirical successes. On the other hand, it's very difficult to say exactly what kind of realist attitude is defensible in that context, given that many of the key challenges to realism really come out much more forcefully in the context of quantum physics than they do in the abstract in general philosophy of science. So we, the hope is that given that scientific realism debate has lost a lot of steam over the past couple of decades, it has become um, somewhat stale as a philosophical debate. The hope is that uh, by looking at some of the key issues that animate scientific realism and debates around it in the more focused context of, for example, quantum mechanics, we can reinvigorate at least some of this debate. We can, we can um, breathe some new life, life into these debates that we still regard as, as, as a very important one. So that's uh, just by way of motivating the, the project and, and how we ended up um, editing the book. Now, shall I continue and say a few words about my own um, take on the matter or what shall we do next? Shall I move on to that? Please, that, if you want to right. say something about that, that that'd be very yeah, helpful. Yeah, so let, let me say something about my own, my own thinking about this. So, I mean, of course there are many, there are many ways of construing scientific realism and exactly what scientific realism stands for. But there's one very prominent aspect of scientific realism, which is an epistemological one, that somehow a scientific realism defends knowledge about the world. We, we care about what the world is actually like and what we know of atoms and electrons and systems that are described by, by quantum theory. And I take knowledge to be factive. Whatever else knowledge is, I, I take it that knowledge is factive. So when you know something, there are some underlying truths that you know. And given that, for myself, it seems to me that this problem of undetermination, which is an old bugbear to scientific realism, I think that problem really raises its head quite forcefully in the context of quantum theory, given the various different ways of understanding what the quantum wave function could be taken to represent. So there were different ways of spelling out what the representational contents of the quantum theory is along the lines of, say, Bohmian mechanics or spontaneous collapse theories or Everettian quantum mechanics, to name some of the prominent alternatives on the table. Now, a natural sort of realist response to that sort of challenge of undetermination would be to point to the mathematical similarities between these different quantum theories. And one may even make the mistake of just calling these different interpretations, thinking that there is uh, one core theory and then different metaphysical interpretations of one and on, one on the same theory. And the thought would be that maybe somebody like uh, a position like structural realism could defend a realism about the shared structure of these, of these quantum theories, saying that, well, when that structure gets interpreted in different metaphysical uh, terms, then it's only at that point when you go beyond what the realist is committed to. But my view is that when one thinks about this issue of undetermination, 
um, more, more carefully in more concrete terms, for example, in relation to spin and how spin functions in explanations of various spin related phenomena and how we understand the sucks of say spintronics or what have you, that sort of undetermination has real bites. And I, I don't see how, for example, structural realism has an effective answer to it. And the worry really is that structural realism, for example, uh, just comes out as a commitment to, um, to kind of merely mathematical content of, of the theory in a way that doesn't really go beyond or doesn't really differ from what a sophisticated instrumentalist would say they are committed to when they are committed to quantum theory. Um, and myself, in my thinking about realism, I've tried to take that issue really, uh, really seriously. And I've ended up thinking that maybe a traditional epistemological construals of realism are inapplicable to, to, to quantum theory, that we shouldn't really think of realism in terms of commitment to theories approximate truth or theories giving us knowledge about atoms, electrons, and so on, um, what I've called truth content realism. And I've toyed with the idea in my paper, I defend the idea that uh, we should give up that sort of that construal of realism, but we shouldn't give up realism altogether. Why? Because I can't quite see any principled way of give, giving up realism regarding quantum theory without giving up realism more broadly. I just don't see any good principled grounds to uh, draw such a line. So I, I think given, given the successes of empirical successes of quantum theory and given the motivations for us to maintain a realist attitude towards quantum physics, we absolutely want to do that even in the face of this fairly powerful undetermination scenario that we have. So what I've tried to do in response is to articulate senses in which we can trust as, uh, quantum theories as theoretical representations. So representations of mind independent reality without equating that kind of realist trust with knowledge or with some sort of claim um, of approximate truth that we can, that we can pin down. So that's basically what my paper is about, trying to reconfigure or rethink what realist commitment might amount to, what it might uh, be to trust quantum theory as a, as a fairly minimal, minimally realist way without collapsing into instrumentalism uh, or constructive empiricism or any of these traditional anti-realist positions. Um, and that's, that, that's, that's the view that I'm, uh, I'm inclined to develop. Now, yeah, that's just an outline of, um, of the book and where I situate myself. It's a large debate. You can, all the chapters put forward uh, very different viewpoints on, on, on these issues. Um, perhaps it's now uh, time for Stephen to say something about this. Yes, thank you, Yuka. Please, Stephen. Um, I don't think I have anything to say uh, more about the the book. Um, uh, you know, I think you has you know captured the the essence of the introduction excellently. Um, I'm obviously not quite so willing to give up on structural realism when it comes to uh, to the underdetermination, but I haven't you know I, I haven't pursued that um, any further. I'm afraid. Um, the other paper that you mentioned in your email uh, represents uh, not just a different approach, but a, diff a completely different way of doing philosophy, as you know, um, the phenomenological line. And that's something that I've been pursuing partly as a historical exercise. Um, I'm kind of interested in appropriating lost um, lines of inquiry from history. And I think <clears throat> this phenomenological approach to the measurement problem uh, represents one of those, but in a sense, it sits, in one sense, it sits completely askew to the realism empiricism debate, as you might think. Um, there've been attempts to squeeze Husserlian phenomenology into into that debate and that I just don't think they're successful. On the other hand, it's sort of in line with um, 
Yuha's prime motivation. I think um, the phenomenologists would absolutely agree that epistemology has to sit at the heart of the philosophical endeavor. Um, uh, they understand the ground of knowledge in quite a different way, of course, than um, you know, the scientific realist in, in general would. Um, but basically, I'm just I'm interested in part partly in just recovering that sort of lost history, and also um, if anyone's read that um, that paper from the book edited by uh, Harold Vilcher, I'm, I'm interested in seeing if if it can be developed into, you know, not necessarily an interpretation that stands alongside the others, but that can do, be developed into an alternative point of view on quantum mechanics that uh, perhaps opens up an entirely you know different avenue of approach um, but as i said it's it's really um sits askew to the whole debate that's 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 captured in in the in the book that you and i co-edited so i think that's all i have thank, thank you Stephen. so now uh, we can move to the q a if anybody wants to be the first one, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, please, Moises, or send me a message that oh. anyway would work. Yeah. Oh, so, well, the first thing was just uh, saying hi. Uh, I um, My computer just was a bit, a bit slow, so I couldn't uh, say hi immediately, but I wanted to thank you for coming. Um, we appreciate it uh, very much. And you know it's been uh, some years of uh, liking and retweeting stuff, so uh, I'm glad to finally have a chance to uh, see you in, in uh, through Zoom. So, and I guess I, I like my first question was for uh, um, for Yuha, we, uh, and I and it's about um, the. Um, the, the notion, the, the, the sort of realism that he's trying to develop in in, uh, in his paper. And so I guess one, one of the things that uh, I, I wonder about is, for example, you mentioned uh, spin realism, right? And you mentioned that uh, at least for uh, since the 20th century, we have some theories that are like are very solid. And we, we, talk, we know, for example, a ton of properties from those theories seem very hard that it seems very it's, it's sort of difficult to think that we're going to revise those at some point. Um, uh, but also you mentioned, for example, some doubts about uh, how uh, frameworks such as structuralism can recover and talk about, for example, the different uh, approaches to quantum mechanics, because there are going to be some differences in the formalism. So I, I wonder how you understand the notion of property here. Uh, because I mean, usually when we, when we think about a, a quantum mechanical property, we usually think about you know, uh, some operator and uh, in relation to Hilbert space. Uh, um, and and in, when we're trying to explain what that is, usually we end up with some sort of very abstract mathematical structure. Uh, and then, you know, the different interpretations try to recover or, 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 or that in some way. Uh, but since your approach is not like that, uh, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about what you understand by properties in this in this realist sense. Yeah, thank you, and yeah, thanks for ha thanks for having us. Um, it's um, I think this is a good example of the kind of question that, in my view, gets us sucked into what I call deep metaphysics very very quickly, uh, answering answering questions such as such as these. So, the motivation for my approach is a very very naturalistic one. So, if uh, any of you guys remember what Fine back in the day in the 80s uh, said about natural ontological attitude. Now Fine in the context of quantum theory said, said that, uh, you know, realism is dead uh, and uh, quantum mechanics are, um, sort of is a good argument for that. But more broadly, so Fine's position of natural ontological attitude was about accepting theories as scientists accept them without going beyond and asking these deep philosophical issues about, uh, or deep philosophical questions about what does realism really, really amount to? And I think I'm sort of 
affiliated with that sort of framing of the realism debate to begin with. I just think that the kinds of issues that philosophers of physics, when they ask these deep, deep questions about how to understand, say, um, properties, property ascriptions in the context of quantum mechanics, they are asking the kinds of questions that simply do not matter for science and simply do not matter for the sucks of science. And therefore, they transcend, there's a sense in which they transcend realist commitments. The realist commitments should not, should not go beyond what science, beyond what science requires. So I'm, I'm sort of quietest about, about these issues. I think you are going to get one, one answer if you pursue uh, philosophy of physics or uh, philosophy of quantum mechanics along, along one line. And you are going to get an other, uh, another answer if you pursue um, it along a different line. Um, and there's nothing really that the, the realist doesn't really need to have a commitment to this, which one of his ways of making sense of quantum mechanics is, is, is the right one. The, the way I rather frame my realist commitments is in terms of um, the existence of there being an account that makes sense of the empirical success of quantum theory. And we can think of these different research programs in philosophy of physics as providing exemplars of these kinds of accounts. It's just that epistemologically, when it comes to our epistemological commitments, uh, given the undetermination, we cannot pick one or another one or another account as being the right one. Or even, even say that we've um, considered all the possible accounts that could be given of the empirical success of this kind of text, textbook quantum, quantum theory. So yeah, coming back to your question, um, I, my, my realism doesn't have any, any sort of commitment or answer to that sort of question. Wayne, please. Okay, hi, thanks. First of all, I just want to thank um, Stephen and Yuha for making this book happen. I was just, you know, just looking at it again this morning and going, what, what, what a fantastic collection of, of papers. And I do know an awful lot of work went into it. Um, Yuha, I want to get clearer about, I mean, I like the idea of um, progress realism and I might be a progress realist myself. But I'm not sure I'm not also a truth content realist. I want I, I, I just want to get clear about what the difference is. Because so so you do say there's progress in how in the ability of theories to represent, right? And so when we represent the world, we say things about the world which presumably have truth values. And so like just take the case of spin the sorts of things we we say are things like you know we prepared this system in a certain spin spin state in which case we say it's got spin up in this direction or we say that these particles are in an entangled state and uh, i mean you do want to say the pro i hope i mean you do want to say the propositions like that have a truth value yes yes so how, how do you differ from a truth content realist? It's in the, maybe truth content realism is a little bit misleading as a term because what matters for me is the sort of cognitive content of, uh, of those propositions. Exactly what, what, what are we saying uh, about the world? So to, to give you, um, to relate this to, um, to the broader realism debate, you might know of Kyle Stanford's work on, on reference, for example. So Kyle Stanford has a paper in, in Journal of Philosophy, which is, I can't remember the exact title, but it's something like, yeah, of course, atom refers, uh, but it's, it's uh, of no, no, it, it, you know, it doesn't really uh, follow that you can be a realist about atoms in, in a sense that matters. So the point is that, uh, just for example, securing um, reference for atom and being able to say that atoms exist, then it's true that atom exists, doesn't really give you much content 
for your realism. In as far as realism is about knowing what you are talking about when you say those things. So it's the cognitive content of the relevant propositions that I worry about. Right. Uh, that cognitive content being being um, very very minimal. Okay, yeah. So, I mean. I mean, any form of realist these days would would be some sort of realism with a certain amount of caution that there's you know there's certain things that we can be fairly confident about and certain things we should leave you know be more or less ag not agnostic about and different versions of truth content realism will differ on exactly what th what that is so uh, I mean, it just seems to me that you're you're just being cautious about what we're being committed to and maybe I can sharpen the my, my comment a bit. Um, I mean, suppose I were to say, well, yeah, um, I'm a realist about quantum mechanics. I don't know exactly what kind of world, what, I don't really know what the world is like at the fundamental level, um, in part because we don't have anything that even pretends to be a fundamental theory. But there's certain things I'm confident about. And, um, I might even go so far as say is that the sorts of things that I think we can confidently um, ex express are actually things that all those avenues um, uh, of approach to what is misleadingly called the interpretation of quantum mechanics have in common. Like in your paper, you emphasize the differences, but I'd just like to push on like the on the similarities. So, for example, when we do a, a um, a procedure that we usually call preparing a particle in a spin up state in um, a certain direction. All of those avenues of interpretation would say, yeah, that, that particle has spin up in, um, in, the, in that direction. Now, they cash it out in different ways on the collapse the theories. The uh, Girardian co um, collaborators recommend you ascribe properties when the, when the, uh, um, when the state is close to an eigenstate of, of the corresponding projector. The, Bohm the Bohmian would talk about the effective wave, wave function of the system. The, uh, um, Everettian would say, well, relative to our branch, it has this thing. But they always say, yeah, that part that particle has spin up in that direction. And I, I mean, that's the sort of thing I think that we should be committed to. But I think that's just plain plain realism. Right. So yeah, you see you see more of the common core right. than, than than I do. Um, it seems to me that uh, the the detailed explanations uh, or that you get when you follow, say, GRW or mm -hmm. or uh, Everettian quantum mechanics and so on, of the different phenomena that quantum mechanics is meant to explain, the different explanations diverge so much that uh, yeah, I'm inclined to think that the sort of the sort of uh, a representational success of the theory that we ought to be committed to as a realist transcends what you identify as the common core. Um, I think I'm sort of mm -hmm. committed to a fairly, fairly uh, beefy a connection between the theory and the reality, how the theory latches onto reality as being the, the reason why the theory is successful to, to, the, uh, to the extent it is. Um, Transcending what you what you recognize as the uh, as the right. common deni common denominator, right. but it just epistemologically beyond our, our our reach. Well, it sounds like we we, we maybe agree because I mean I do think that there are certain things that are beyond our reach, um, and but the, that what I'm calling the common core is not um, the common core strikes me as pretty darn beefy. Anyways, let's, let's let's move on. There's a whole queue of questions. Well, thanks for that. Uh, we'll have to carry on that time. Yeah, time. absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Wayne and Yuha. Uh, it's my turn. So I have I have a question about uh, Yuha's chapter in the book, and something that I I wasn't understanding very clearly is what progress means from this epistemological perspective, because it seems that as you talk about knowledge and the factive condition of knowledge, 
it's, it cannot be only to be able to manipulate or to be able to experiment. And also in order to like to fit a realist commitments, it has to be something that stays at least for longer or a stronger in a stronger sense than what we usually call scientific knowledge. And so I was wondering if, if you have um, any more details on what progress means for you for this realism Progress realism, please. Yeah, thank you. I mean, so given that we are dealing with realism here, the kind of progress that I've got in mind is representational progress regarding things that are beyond what we can observe by the, by the naked eye. So there's going kind to, of, of course, common shared ground with the anti-realist that science uh, is becoming more and more empirically adequate, and our theories are getting better and better at making predictions in all domains and so on. So if there's any difference between realist and unrealist, it's got to be about how our theories are representing the un unobservable reality uh, going beyond empirical adequacy. So what, I, what, what, I got, what I've got in mind is that um, you look at the history of science and you see uh, sort of good explanations of our past theories from later vantage points. Why was Newtonian, why is Newtonian gravity empirically successful to the extent it is in its, in its domain? You can, from the vantage point of general, general theory of relativity, you can study Newtonian gravity and the way and its inter-theoretic relationship to GTR, and you can use that to uh, account for uh, the empirical successes of Newtonian gravity, even while you admit that um, from the relativistic standpoint, uh, there simply isn't any gravitational force, for example. Gravity simply cannot be understood in those terms involving a force. That's, that's uh, not, not, the, not the ontology uh, you, can, you can have. So there's a sense in which one can uh, take Newtonian gravitational theory as being uh, representational is successful in ways that can be articulated from that later vantage point. So now applying that thought to, to, to quantum theory, the thought is that a similar thing is going on, going on here. Of course, exactly how optimistic we should be in, tr in terms of future science, <laughs> putting us in a position where we can, with the, kind of, with the benefit of hindsight, look back and explain in a similar way um, the empirical successes of uh, a quantum theory as we have it now, that's, that's not something I, um, I take any, any stand on, you know, whether, whether it's sort of humanly possible for us to develop theories that we are justified in, uh, in believing uh, in, in the way we are justified in committing ourselves to GTR. Uh, but that's, that's, the sort of, that's the sort of thought of representational progress. Um, does that help at all? just wondering um as you as you mentioned sometimes in the paper uh, the idea of knowledge as indicative like in a sense the growth of uh the acquisition of more knowledge um uh, as indicative of this uh, epistemic progress i was wondering if you have any idea of which type of knowledge would you be able to commit to because if you go from objectual knowledge okay that's that's going to be fine that that is not going to privilege any of the these philosophical interpretations that we have for instance, about quantum mechanics. But if you keep moving forward and then you get uh, a strong commitments about, for instance, certain kinds of explanatory knowledge in physics, then it might be not that easy to like to reject these philosophical commitments about what is making this theory successful and so on. And so um, I was I was wondering more about um, the type of knowledge that we get when we are having this representational progress in, in the sciences. Right. I guess what matters for me, I mean, going back to what Wayne said, so perhaps we can, you know, uh, to take ourselves to have knowledge about what the, what the common denominator is to all the current approaches to making sense of, say, uh, qu quantum mechanics. What matters for me is this idea that there's still a kind of a deeper reason why these theories are, are successful to the, to the extent they are. And there's this kind of representational connection to reality that underlies it. Um, 
And that transcends, so I just want to drive a wedge between sort of realist commitments to, to things we can claim to know that we can cash out as knowledge claims and things that the realist wants to be committed to. Into, you know, how do you trust the theory? In what sense, what's your sort of, uh, what's the um, content of your commitment to trusting quantum theory when you work with it? And it just seems to me to go beyond these these knowledge knowledge claims that's that's the thoughts that you can drive a van so conceptually you can drive a van i mean that's one of the points of the paper that you can conceptually make room for realism that's that's a matter of there existing an appropriate representational relation that underlies successes without us knowing that that's one one point kind of made in the abstract and then there's the thought that well actually in the case of quantum theory that sort of attitude uh, is is appropriate for the realist. That's the realist trust in theory should go beyond what we what we um, want to take ourselves to know of quantum reality. So of course there, there there is knowledge about quantum reality. You can take something like say Bell's theorem. You know, surely it you know gives us knowledge about the world. It's undeniable. So there there, there is knowledge about quantum reality. But the thought is that the the full explication or articulation of the realist trust towards quantum theory goes goes beyond that. Goes beyond what we um, um, what we would regard as sort of um, justified knowledge claims, all things considered, where we consider, for example, the fact that there's a real, genuine sort of underdetermination in this area of physics, not just some sort of philosopher's plaything where you think of underdetermination in terms of uh, you know the possibility of um, there being some sort of some sort of theory that is empirically equivalent with your theory, but one you, you can't really formulate. Well, in quantum theory, we really do have these these real real alternatives, and I take that to be significant. Thank you very much, Yuha. Um, let's let's move to the next question, Quentin, please. Yes. Hello. Uh... Yes, my question is a bit easier to the other uh, more question about label maybe uh, I'm wondering at what, why should we call this position that uh, that you are presenting uh, uh, why should we call it realism and uh, that's the general acceptation of uh, realism as a position which has a semantic epistemic and metaphysical component and there you seem to challenge or not to be committed to the semantic aspect or that's how I understand it. I'm not sure, but uh, so I'm wondering what exactly why should we call it realist? Or is it only a virtual term because uh, I know we, we should be realist or something, or is there a common commitment to to correspondence truths or to a just if uh, an approach towards justification, like the best explanation, or, yeah. I'm Quentin, just I, am, what, what I am not sure uh, your mic is working well, so. It might be your connection also. Right, I mean, the connection uh, wasn't perfect, so I yeah. think I, I perhaps didn't get all of it, but I, let me just, respond to what I what I got from from that. So yeah, I mean, I, I uh -huh. totally acknowledge that uh, in um, sort of reconfiguring what I take to be significant for the realist position, there's a, there's a risk for sort of terminological um, <laughs> disagreements, you know, what should we call these, what should we call these resulting views or resulting mm -hmm. positions. Um, and yeah, I, I, nothing really for myself, nothing really, really hangs on that. So if one wants to define realism in a way that simply is inapplicable to the kind of view that I've uh, sketched, then yeah, let's call it something else. Um, what really matters for myself is um, this idea that realism is about um, trust in, in theories. Like how do how do you trust your your best theories? What's the right? What what is that attitude of trust when you take your, you take your theories very seriously? So an anti-realist constructive empiricist might say, for example, that you know we we only trust our theories uh, to the extent of them giving us 
um, knowledge about observable matters and so on. Of course, they, they put realism in terms of the aim of science and so on. Um, for myself, what matters to, to, to realism is really articulating that, that sense of trust. And I, I just don't see that idea being wedded to these uh, kind of semantic components um, in the way that so Statis Psilos or, or some other realists, uh, you know, the way they define realism that yeah, well. has to involve, it has to involve the semantic components, our key theories refer and so on. Um, Yeah, uh, but I have I have the impression that the instrumentalist can claim that he trusts someone who re reinterpret the content of theories in purely instrumentalist ways could say, yeah, I really trust uh, all of the theories. Uh, I think they are very efficient for anything I could do, and but there's nothing more. I, uh, but. I, we wouldn't call this uh, realism. So, well, I think that's, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't know if well, I'm clear. Was, I have the impression that trust and the realism are different, uh, are different attitudes. That realism is more like about the content, but maybe it's just the terminological issue. So, yeah. And yeah, for myself, okay. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it matters that. Um, Realism is committed to a certain kind, there existing a certain kind of um, reason for the empirical success of our best theories. So think of it in terms of this you no know, miracles idea that motivates much of realism, this idea that we simply can't make sense of the success of science if, uh, you know, if our theories aren't systematically latching, latching onto reality. Now, traditionally, instrumentalists haven't really bought into that idea at all. Um, I, and Van Frasen, for example, provides a kind of a Darwinian story of how scientific theories can mm -hmm. be can be successful uh, without them latching onto reality at the, at the level of the unobservable structures at all. Um, and yeah, traditionally instrumentalists have tried to replace um, this kind of representational success that I'm after with these ideas that, well, it just matters that scientific theories are successful in, in ways that are either pragma reliable pragmatically or instrumentally and so on. So that's the only kind of relationship they need to have to reality. Um, so it, it, a very different kind of explanation of the, of the sucks of science is, um, is being offered or expected if one looks, looks so, The realist sort of expectation regarding future science, I think, diverges radically from some sort of uh, instrumentalist or, or um, pretty pragmatist approach to, to, to science and explaining its success. So Kyle Stanford, for example, just to elaborate. So Kyle Stanford is one of these kind of neo-instrumentalists and he's very open about, you know, science should really be extremely open-minded about where to go next. Because according to him, we really can't expect at all um, or make any sort of um, rational expectations about how future sciences ought to um, explain or account for our current, current scientific theories empirical adequacy or to the extent they are empirically adequate. Whereas my sort of realism um, does expect that uh, future sciences will explain our current theories and critical successes in ways that are kind of coherent with what we've got in the working sciences at the moment. So that those kinds of those okay. kinds of differences that I think okay. make it a bit more substantial than just the terminological. Um, okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you to both of you. Uh, now Christian has a question, please. Well, thank, thank you. Maria, thank you, Moises, also for, for the organization of this great meeting. Uh, my question was for Stephen, and it may be a, a little bit out of the out of the scope of the book, but I, I didn't. Want to, I wanted I wanted to take advantage of the fact that uh, you're here to to ask you about the measurement problem and the way you are attempting to solve it through a phenomenological approach, which sounds to me very interesting. So, so if you could say something about that. Um. <laughs> I'm not sure I would say that I'm attempting 
to solve it. Um, so again, let me let me say, okay, um, I, I don't know how many people um, read my paper, but there there is a, already a solution to the measurement problem that was presented in 1939 by London and Bauer. Um, Fritz London, of course, um, was you know I, I think one of the great physicists of the 20th century. Gave the first quantum explanation of uh, chemical bonding and superconductivity and superfluidity. Um, Edmund Bauer was a kind of a jobbing physicist. Um, that's a little bit dismissive because uh, he was actually a, a hero of the French resistance during the war. Um, but London um, is the guy I think who, who really was behind this, uh, what Wigner called this uh, very nice little book. It's longer than a paper, but shorter than a book. And London, as well as um, being a physicist, um, was a student of phenomenology and actually um, uh, got his dissertation in, uh, in phenomenology, Husserlian phenomenology. Um, now, the, the, their little book gets picked up by Wigner uh, at the end of the 50s and presented as summarizing uh, what Wigner called the orthodox approach. At that time, there was a kind of massive dispute within what we would now call the Copenhagen interpretation as to what constituted or orthodoxy. And you had Rosenfeld and others saying that, you know, it was Bohr and complementarity has to be at the heart of our understanding of quantum mechanics. On the opposing view, you had Wigner who said, no, no, it's all <clears throat> to do with consciousness. And he kind of appropriates London and Bauer's little book and says the orthodox solution to the measurement problem is nicely set out by London and Bauer. And the solution is, you know, take the example of Schrodinger's cat. When you open the box, what collapses the wave function is consciousness, the consciousness of the observer. It has to be something non-physical. That's what von Neumann was getting on about. That's what London and Bauer sort of articulate very nicely. Um, and then of course, Putnam and Shimoni kind of just, you know, give that account, you know, the thrashing that so many people thought it richly deserved and it basically sank um, into the mists of history and, and that opened up the space for, for Bohm, for Everett and so on. Um, but as Shimoni subsequently um, acknowledged, they had misinterpreted the London and Bauer paper. Um, and I haven't yet decided whether Wigner misunderstood it or deliberately obscured the phenomenological aspect to it. But my claim, and not everyone agrees, Otavio Bueno disagrees with me, for example, but you know, he disagrees with me about almost everything. So, eh, so what? Um, but <clears throat> I claim if you read that paper very carefully, you can see um, really running throughout the paper, um, this kind of phenomenological perspective. I mean, London uh, begins the paper by saying that um, you know, quantum mechanics is not just a physical theory, um, it's an epistemology, it's a whole account of knowledge. And at the core of this account is the relationship between subject and object. And interestingly, <clears throat> I've only just come to sort of realize this through um, reading the draft of a forthcoming book by Guido Bacigalupi and Elise Krull on EPR and Schrodinger's cat. This was a central concern of Schrodinger. He says this, Schrodinger says this again and again in letters and in uh, to Einstein and to others, that the heart of quantum mechanics is the relationship between subject and object. And that comes out in the London and Bauer paper and their solution to the measurement problem, finally get round to your, to your question after all this preamble is, <clears throat> um, it's not that consciousness is somehow outside of the wave function and then somehow causes it to collapse. It's rather that the subject, um, you know, the physical, you know, the observer is also enters into the, into the superposition along with the cat, you know, the box, the cat, the Geiger counter, the, you know, radioactive material and so on. Um, but the subject has, as they put it, and this is direct, I think, phenomenology, um, uh, and Wigner repeats this without being really aware of what he's, he's repeating. The subject has um, to themselves, they say, relations of a very special character. Um, by introspection, 
they are able to establish uh, imminent knowledge, okay, uh, of their of their of their state. They are able to establish um, uh, that they have a certain state through a creative act, and they sort of, as it were, object you know, make objective this state. And the way I understand it is that rather than, as I said, the consciousness causing the collapse of the wave function, what you have is a separation, right? The wave function, as it were, separates out into what Husserl calls the object pole and the subject pole or the ego. Um, it's not as if the ego is there beforehand. It kind of comes out of this um, uh, wave function. Um, and this is a sort of creative act of, of, of objectification. Um, and so that's, that's, their, that's their solution. Um, and this is, you know, in a sense, happening all the time. Um, and so from their perspective, and from the Husserlian perspective, it really makes no sense to talk of quantum entities having states as, you know, separately from us. Um, the state of the, of the system is, uh, uh, can only be ascribed in relation to the state of the observer. Right, um, so it's a relational perspective, and that's that's what I think is quite interesting because you find that relational perspective. You find it in Everett, you find it in um, Ravelli's work, for example, uh, most especially. Again, interestingly, you find it in Schrödinger time and again in the letters uh, to Einstein. Schrödinger, you know, thinks about look, it's this it's this relation relational aspect that I find really um, interesting, and so that's what I'm trying to somehow you know not very clearly articulate here, but in my book, hopefully more clearly articulate that, there, that what lies behind the phenomenological account uh, or solutions to the measurement problem is this relational aspect. What makes it different from say the Everettian or the Ravellian account um, is this um, subjective aspect, the role of the observer. Um, do you link, Stephen, would you yeah. link it to, to uh, Cubism, to, to Chris Fuchs? Uh, well, this is <laughs> realism. It's so it's, it's really interesting because after I, I, I gave my talk at, at the Graz, Graz conference from where that paper was taken, um, Chris Fuchs um, uh, wrote to me and he, I don't, uh, do you know, do you know uh, Chris? Yeah. Fuchs? Well, he's, of course, as soon as you make contact with him, he's this sort of, <laughs> your email box gets full of this. Uh, and here's another paper, you should read this. <laughs> so, um, and uh, unfortunately, I think there are, there are connections. I think there are clearly connections. I haven't had time, you know, I just haven't had time to explore them. Um, I haven't made as much progress on this book as I would have liked. Um, I'm slightly skeptical of information theoretic aspect. Um, I don't think, um, I'm slightly skeptical that it can, be it can be reduced to a kind of quantum Bayesian aspect. I think that is too minimal. Really, for the for, certainly from the from the phenomenological point of view. Having said that, there was someone, and I I really sorry I've forgotten her name, but she's a student of Michelle Bitbowls, and she gave a talk at the conference that linked um, uh, phenomenology and cubism in a way that I thought was very interesting. But I, I, again, I haven't looked at it, and I actually I think I've I've slightly may have fallen out a little bit with Chris because I wrote a, a blog post for something in which I, I talked about this stuff and I mentioned Ravelli and I didn't mention Fuchs and he sent me an email and said, what do you mean, what are you, what are you talking about Ravelli for? This relational stuff, you know, it's not gonna work. You should go on, what's wrong with you? I thought you were coming onto the cubism side. And I was like, dude, I'm kind of neutral at the moment. <laughs> you know, I haven't even got that into that yet. I think there are, connect I think, I mean, phenomenology, you know, as you, as I'm sure you appreciate, phenomenology is not just an interpretation. It's not just an approach. It's like a whole um, different way of doing philosophy. And there are all kinds of strands and themes and disputed groups within it. And I think you can make it fit with cubism or with relationalism, even with a, a form of, I mean, remember the many minds view that preceded, you know, current discussions of, of Everett. I think you can, you can link it to that. Um, but as I say, I haven't yet got to that point where I can say anything more, more definite. Thank you, Stephen. Um, we, have, we have four questions, so maybe if we try to like to make it more precise, that would 
help for the questions, not the rest of them, of course. Federico, please. Yes, uh, my question is related to Wayne's um, and also the discussion about phenomenology. Um, it seems to me as a physicist it, that it's true, we can say that something exists, but not just that, because every day we know more. We know more and more about the atoms. So when you read uh, a book like yours, uh, you say, well, that's a huge problem because we have metaphysical and determination. But when you read Husserl and you read uh, continuators of the phenomenological approach to philosophy, uh, you, you, you become more quiet. You, know? you say, OK, you have to separate between knowledge about the life world in which you know through sedimentation and you know structures that exist in the life world and you know every day more and more about them in an infinite task of physics or, or science, then you, you, you become more quiet. I become quiet. But then I, I think that uh, some philosophers cannot separate between a highly speculative uh, assertion such as there are many words and assertions about what we, the, the, the network of concepts and um, tasks that we do in the lab, which is not positivism and it is not uh, subjectivism like in Cubism either. And it is not surely in instrumentalism. Uh, phenomenology is a different philosophical approach to the whole history of philosophy. So when I read Husserl, <laughs> I think that I have a lot of knowledge about atoms and I know that they exist in a very concrete way. And I, and, and I know that every day we know more about them. So my question is, uh, why, why not going deeper into this direction and why in your book, uh, I, I only read half of it because we are half of the book, all right? Uh, why, why not including this kind of realism also in, in a kind of a debate about realism, scientific realism. That's my question. It's a kind of worry. Uh, Are you asking me or, th or you? Ha? Uh, both of you. Uh, I just want to say that I was glad to hear that you wrote this article on, on phenomenology and I'm going to read it. <laughs> sure. Read Look, just, just, just for me, just to say, and, I'll, and then I'll let you ha. Um, uh, Okay, you said a lot of things there, but I, I don't think it's necessary um, uh, to be, you know, to, it, it doesn't follow that if you're a phenomenologist, you're somehow quiet about things. On the contrary, I think phenomenology <laughs> are very noisy. I think you can be very noisy as a phenomenologist. Um, uh, I also don't think that, just to say what, you know, one thing, you know, Husserl wrote a famous book in, in the 1935, I think called The Crisis of the European Sci Sciences, um, where he, it's a really, um, I wouldn't uh, advocate reading this book right now during the time of pandemic, because it's a really a cry of despair, of sort of existential despair. Um, and he basically thinks that, you know, blames Galileo you know, for introducing mathematics into science, and that's really been the you know the root of all that, of all evil, and it's been downhill ever since. Um, and you know, I think if you read that book, you kind of retreat into the life world, and you would tend to adopt an anti that would suggest an anti-realist approach, not for any of the reasons that Van Frassen and others adopt, but for the reasons that, according to her, so you can't um, or you shouldn't mathematize. Uh, the world. And I, I would completely reject that. And I think many f current phenomenologists would, would reject that. Um, uh, as for why we didn't include that in the book, um, as I said, this is a completely kind of skew to the current realism, anti-realism debate. And I, I don't know what, I think Yuha would have reacted with horror if I'd suggested we put something like, like that, that in the book. I think this is an entirely separate um, line on these whole whole set of, of of problems, and I don't think it would belong in, in a book of the kind that that you know, um, you ha and I had in mind. Yeah, I mean, whenever you do philosophy, you have to begin from somewhere, and these different philosophical traditions really can be quite sort of 
orthogonal to, to one another. So, so much of my work, for example, is very much in this sort of naturalistic tradition of, of doing philosophy of science, doing philosophy of science in a way that's very much continuous with science. And actually my current research, I'm really thinking about realism at this kind of meta level, um, because there, there is a bit of a puzzle about realism. I, if one thinks of realism in, in a naturalistic way, uh, what, deba what debate can there be about scientific uh, theories, given that you have all the scientific evidence for the theories. So what, what more can you ask? <laughs> what, are the, what, what is the debate about, given that when you talk about, for example, atoms, there's all the evidence for the atoms. There's all the evidence for these theories. So what could you possibly be debating about, <laughs> given that, uh, you know, at the level of science, the case is closed, <laughs> uh, apart from some details. So there is this kind of puzzle of making sense of realism debate to, to begin with, especially if one approaches the debate in a very naturalistic point of view. Um, but yeah, one, ha one has to start, start from somewhere and the different traditions of, of approaching these questions are really, can really be quite far apart. Yeah, may I reply? If, if you're going to be quick, yes. If no, not, just try to be quick, okay? Okay, yes. No, I read the, the, it's a very influential book, The Crisis of Sciences. Uh, I agree. And it, it gives you a, a sensation of despair, but at the same time, it hits the point on a, on a crisis of science that we uh, are going on. And it is natural because science is not, not a close ever. So I tend to see my scientific activity as a work in progress all the time. We are all the time sedimenting and reviewing the concepts and trying to go beyond. It's not like uh, the conception of the world is never going to change. It is going to change. And that is the whole, the whole uh, idea of science. But the thing is that through that process, we can get, gain knowledge about that. And I agree, this project of phenomenology is antagonic to some uh, other views of philosophy. But I tend to think that uh, some of these discussions tend to crystallize physics and think that, okay, from the point of view of physics, there are no problems. No, 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 it's just the other way around. When you go to a conference in physics, physics is full of problems. And we know, we actually know that these theories nowadays are going to change. And we are working on that. That's, that's the whole point. Okay, that, that was my, my observation. I guess we can move then to the next question, which is from Raon Yarroyo and I'm gonna be reading it. So it, it is to, for Steven and it says, hi, Professor Steven. I have two brief questions about your paper on phenomenology. First, do you think there could be a phenomenological toolbox in addition to the metaphysical toolbox for us to rummage and make sense of the London and Bowers in the deep realist sense? And the second question is, one thing that was not clear to me is the phenomenological approach to quantum mechanics and additional interpretation to the collapse interpretations, many worlds and hidden variables interpretation, or is it something different? And thank you very much. Um, uh, oh, the first question, yeah, both questions, excellent question. I think that first question, absolutely. Look, look, I am, oh, gosh. So I used to call my approach the Viking approach. Um, in the idea of, you know, the Vikings would come marauding into the valley and steal, you know, the peasants' goods and so on. And then Kerry McKenzie thought that was a bit of a violent image. And so she suggested the toolbox approach. Kerry, of course, is a very gentle soul. And um, I said, okay, fine, let's call it the toolbox approach. I, I apply it to metaphysics, I apply it to history, I apply it to everything. I appropriate stuff. And I, absolutely, I'm trying to make sense of London and Bauer. Now, there's one way of doing that, which is to go to London's historical roots um, in, in phenomenology and kind of construct carefully how, you know, reconstruct his thought. Actually, uh, you know, for good or ill, I've decided not to do that. And I'm sort of pulling on bits of, of you know, local aspects of phenomenology from that time, but also from recent accounts, Dan Zahavi's book on metaphysics and phenomenology, I found tremendously useful. Um, because uh, look, I, sh I, should, I should say very clearly, I don't consider myself a, a, a follower of phenomenology. I'm doing this as a kind of exercise. I'm a structural realist. 
despite what Yuha says, I still think structural realism is the way to go. But I want to see if this, uh, this other approach can be made to work. So yes, absolutely. I'm, I see phenomenology as offering a, a rich array of devices from which um, we can pluck um, you know, various tools and, uh, um, to make sense of what I think has been a sort of, as I keep saying, a sort of lost history. As for the second question, um, I mean, although I said it's skewed to all of this debate, it can be related to these other positions. Not so much GRW, not so much Bohm, but certainly Everett. Um, so here's a sort of cheap uh, comparison. According to David Wallace, how do you get probability out of the Everett interpretation, right? You have to stick the subject back in there. The Born rules follow from decision theoretic principles. They follow from principles of rationality. So in a get, you know, the Everett interpretation hasn't really lost the subject entirely to make sense of the notion of world and uh, to, as I said, to retain the Born rules you have to put a, some sense of subject back in there. So you can directly compare that with the kind of interpretation that I think, or the kind of approach that I think London and Bauer were trying for. Um, so I think there can be comparisons, but ultimately you're gonna find um, to articulate the notion of the subject, what probability means for, for, the, for, the, for London and Bauer, what objectivity means, you're going to find yourself articulating those concepts in ways that are very different from uh, the way those notions are used by myself, in other words, works, by Yuha, by Wayne, by the other contributors of the book, uh, to the book. So in that sense, the phenomenological approach is, you know, just entirely different. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, Moises has another question for you, I think. So, yes. Moises, please. Yes, also, I mean, I guess also taking advantage of the fact that you uh, uh, are visiting uh, uh, Stephen as well. So uh, even though you don't have an article in the in the in this book, uh, I did wanted to ask, uh, like, I, I actually like I have very strong uh, structural realist inclinations. So, uh, but there's something, for example, uh, I'm wondering about uh, that maybe has something to do with your book on uh, ontic structural realism and your book on the applicab applicability of mathematics, which is um, how should we think about uh, quantum theory and uh, in, 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 as, a, as a representation of tool? Uh, so how, how can we extract realist commitments from the, from, uh, um, quantum quantum theory is seen as a mathematical object. Mm -hmm. And I guess, I mean, one worry that I, that I have is that, for example, in your, in your, uh, in your uh, 2014 book, you, one of the things that you mentioned is that um, in the standard interpretation, for example, uh, there might be cases where um, there's, it's indeterminate. What are the quantum mechanical properties there are? Um, and then it, if that's the case, it seems to be, it seems that when you have to represent that, uh, you cannot even, it's not even clear how you can even fit that, for example, even with the partial structures approach, because it's not, it's not so much that you don't know, uh, for example, for some, pro, for some particle, whether it's located, whether it's located there or not, but that is indeterminate, whether it has a location and so on for other, other properties. So I guess I, I, I was wondering, what's your position right now, I guess, on the on, on relation between mathematical structure and it's uh, the interpretation, it's real, it's, it, it's real, it's commitments when, when it comes to representation. Um, that's a really, that's a really big question. I'm not sure I could, um, <clears throat> how much I can, how much I can say. I mean, first of all, um, uh, I guess where perhaps I differ from you, Ha, is that I'm more prepared to go, well, I'm prepared to go deeper into the metaphysical pool than he is, um, perhaps too deep, perhaps, you know, way off into the deep, I go off on the, the deep end of metaphysics. Um, I think of, from the structuralist perspective, I think of property as a kind of secondary metaphysical category. 
I think it's dependent on structure. Um, and I think that can be made naturalistic because I think that kind of follows the usual way, at least the way I've always thought of properties, you know, the way that I try and articulate in the book, you know, the spin is dropping out from the relevant symmetry structures and, and so forth. <clears throat> I think it also corresponds to the way um, Catherine, Catherine Brading, for example, has, has articulated the way that uh, Newton thought of properties as um, kind of dropping out of the laws. Um, and then you can, here's the, here's the issue then, so you can sort of present that mathematically, right? You can, you can, you know, my go-to example is, you know, permutation symmetry, and you can show how, you know, here you have the permutation group, here are two of the representations of the permutation group. They correspond to Bose, one corresponds to Bose-Einstein physics, the other corresponds to Fermi-Dirac physics. Um, that's just giving the physics, right? And it seems to me to be a realist, you, want, you need to go a bit further. Now, then the issue is how much further? How deep into the pool of metaphysics do you go? Um, and that's where I think, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of a, of a balancing act. And that's where I think you, I, I think you can draw on or utilize current tools of metaphysics. So you want, I would argue that you want to try and capture that mathematical relationship between say the group and the representation of the group in terms of some metaphysical notion, whether it's determinability or dependence or, or, or whatever, that's what I've been um, trying to do. Um, and, you know, to do that, I think you, you, you know, you have to really get stuck into the nitty gritty details in a way that I can't, you know, we can't, um, do here. I, I think there are real, real issues that Yuha has highlighted in his chapter on on spin. Um, but that would be that would be my way of you know to, to getting at, getting at it. If you begin with if you th if you think as as you know Yuha, Yuha has very nicely presented it in terms of you know representations. The issue for me is, you know, if you want to go beyond the mathematics. What, how does one do that? What, what, what are you doing when you go beyond the mathematics? You're supplying an interpretation. It seems to me immediately then you're, you're sort of at least knee deep in some metaphysics, even to talk of you know, property, much less talk of particle, you're engaged in metaphysics. And then the issue is, well, where do you stop? How shallow do you want to, <clears throat> to be? You stick at the shallow end of the metaphysical pool or do you go a bit deeper? I've always suggested you should go a little bit deeper um, to make, you know, partly just to, to help make sense of the notion of structure. And then the issue is, you know, coming back to the issue of knowledge, well then, um, what's the content of your knowledge? It's not just the mathematics. It involves these, you know, metaphysical notions. Um, and then it becomes, then, then you run up precisely into the kinds of issues that arise in the book where you have this kind of underdetermination. Um, I still retain a naive hope that the structuralist approach can undercut the underdetermination. But it's there are various forms of underdetermination. It appears in various guises, and whether, as it were, the same structuralist response will work in all cases is is really not at all clear to me. I'm sorry, that's a bit hand wavy. I don't know if that's really helped. My question was very hand wavy too, so it's it, it's perfect. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just but you know there there isn't much time, so I wanted to put it a lot in there. So sure, it's perfectly sure. fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to both of you, Moises. Please stop tricking us. And um, and then Jonas has a question, and then Frederick has a question. Please, Jonas. Okay. Thank you, Maria and Moises, for the organization, and Stephen and you have for being present. I'll make a, a general question because I think this one is a theme that has uh, appeared along all the talk in, since the beginning, and it concerns the issue of epistemology. Because as you mentioned in the beginning, well, the, the problem of realism has to be sort of readdressed directly from the point of view of the theories and more specific theories. And Stephen mentioned sometimes in his papers that we need some metaphysics and there's a whole discussion about metaphysics being closer to science too, and how much uh, we need metaphysics and how close to science that can be. And so my question is, if the, the same question for epistemology is not lacking in this debate, because 
at least to me, it seems that epistemology is almost always taken for granted as a, a very traditional field in philosophy so far. So I would like to know how much, how much do you reflect on that? For instance, in Yuha's version of naturalism, and for Stephen, he mentioned, well, according to the uh, point of view of Bonner, London and Bauer, for instance, uh, quantum mechanics is an epistemology. So how much epistemology does not need to be reshaped also to deal with um, these uh, challenges from quantum theory? So that's just a, a short co comment from you. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for that. Um, I think you are putting your your finger on the on the issue that I've got. I I just have to link this to what Stephen said. Um, I, I can't 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 avoid doing that. So I mean, the from a fairly kind of naturalistic standpoint, the issue with the kind of metaphysics that ontological structural realism um, necessarily involves is is exactly epistemological. Um, so the kinds of the kinds of worries that I've got um, just spring from this tension that I see from this kind of metaphysical um, depth of articulating, for example, properties in terms of symmetries and laws, and getting sucked quite in quite deep into the metaphysics of science in a way that really goes well beyond uh, well beyond science. So when one talks about knowledge, one needs the justification aspect as well. You need to have warrants for your, for, your, for your beliefs. And for naturalistic philosophers such as myself, the question becomes, where do you get that warrants for these metaphysical um, presuppositions that you need in order to articulate uh, stru structuralism in this kind of ontological tradition? That's the, that, that is the sticking point, really, for myself. I think it's interesting in that um, in this broad heading, under this broad heading of structural realism, people have ended up saying radically different things about quantum mechanics. So uh, St Stephen is here, uh, and you know he has a book length, wonderful um, articulation and 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 exploration of what you know what this what this comes to. But then you, of course, you have the likes of James Ladyman. Uh, Stevens, Stevens student, ex student, uh, who whose uh, ontological structural realism kind of has has grown uh, rather different, uh, involving you know real patterns and uh, etc. Very different ways of articulating what, what what it is to be committed to structures ontologically. And when it comes to quantum theory, um, it's it's a little bit hard, tricky to figure out exactly what James is committed to as an ontological structural realist, but he sure, he sure isn't committed to, to much of what Stephen is committed to. So there's, a, there's, a, there's an interesting di diversion there or di divergence there. And so from an epistemological point of view, the, the question of warrants really, really comes up to me. I mean, why do we, when we are, when the realist is committed to quantum theory due to its empirical success, how much do we get from those empirical, from that empirical evidence um, and, and from the fact that the theory is successful in these ways and has certain features that make it coherent. So how much justification do we have for going beyond science what's clearly metaphysics proper? And that's, I think, that is, I think there's one of the, one of the biggest questions um, here. At what point is a realist, has a realist gone sort of, gone too, meta, too deeply into the metaphysics from an epistemological point of view? So we have a question by Frederick. Um, Frederick, please. Yep. Uh, good afternoon, yeah, folks. Um, well, uh, firstly, I, I I'd like to comment. I'm I'm writing a paper about uh, Wigner's thoughts, uh, and uh, this paper was really really rich for me uh, for my writing now. Uh, I work with with uh, Olival Freire in in Brazil, uh, and uh, I I felt that it's it's very would be very interesting to publish something trying to to explain better uh, the philosophical uh, uh, positions and uh, uh, influences in Wigner. And my question is about uh, how could I, I say 
uh, how how far uh, could I say that Wigner follows followed uh, Londerbauer, in fact? Uh, because uh, if we uh, follow the all the papers, Wigner's papers, uh, when the, he wrote about the stop, the measured problem in quantum mechanics, uh, I I found some some structure in his arguments that I, I'm not sure how, uh, if phenomenology is, is really connected with his arguments. And I would say that, in fact, London Bauer, as was to Cimoni, uh, really inspired them to the problem in quantum, in measuring uh, quantum mechanics, uh, measuring process in quantum mechanics. But uh, the the methodological pathway, how Wigner's use uh, uh, Wigner's friend, call it Wigner's friend uh, paradox, uh, the examples that he used, is much more to focus on the uh, showing a limit case in, in physics. Uh, Wigner says many times in, in several papers that in fact he's, he's uh, searching for uh, this limit case in in physics, that, and he explained that the limit case is similar what Einstein saw in in end of ninth century uh, about the relation between light and matter, and now we are uh, the the von Neumann's uh, formalism show us that there is a relation between the measurement process and mind. So uh, maybe uh, we could try to. Uh, construct a unifying science, put in mind in inside of natural science uh, 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 project, uh, research project, uh, seriously. Uh, and he sometimes he cited, uh, oh, Freud tried to do it, but well, physics is the time to physicists uh, to deal with. Uh, so uh, I, I can see much more connection with Margenau, uh, uh, some perspective in Margenau philosophy uh, about his approach, his pathway, methodological pathway, then um, uh, phenological uh, strategies. I, I would say that London Bauer, the paper of the, the whole of the end is much more to show the problem, but the strategy that Wigner's use is a mix set of many, many uh, perspectives, but I would say that Margenau has a really strong influence in his, his thoughts. So I, I would like the, the opinion of, of you, French or uh, Seth. Um, look, no, I, I didn't, I certainly did not say that Wigner had any interest in phenomenology. I actually think Wigner's philosophical views were quite superficial. I agree, Mar Margenau is the one who alerts him to the paper from Putnam. Um, where Putnam's talking about the EPR paradox and Margenau thinks it's a really stupid paper. And he tells Wigan, he says, we need to write a reply. And that's where they write this paper where they say, look, we're gonna present the orthodox approach to the measurement problem. And that approach is captured in a very nice little book by London and Bauer. I, I don't think Wigner really had any idea that London and Bauer were coming at it from a phenomenological perspective. Yeah. I think Margano did, and I and I um, I I don't quite know. I don't know if he if he talked to Wigner about this. Margano did because Margano, of course, had a critique. Had a you know, Margano was a much more philosophically reflective um, physicist and philosopher of science, um, and he actually wrote a, he published a critique of phenomenology, um, not a very good one, but he published you know that back in the nineteen. Uh, 40s. So I don't know if Margenau um, talked to Wigner about this, but there's no indication um, that he did. No, no, I think Wigner just appropriated, just the way that I appropriate things, Wigner appropriated the London and Bauer uh, manuscript in order to drive home the point that he saw consciousness as, as central. And that, as you say, as you indicate, that's driven by long-held concerns that he had, that kind of bubble up again and again. Um, and by the way, I, th I think um, Olive Alferes Jr.'s book, uh, Quantum Dissidence, is wonderful. If anyone's interested in the history of 
uh, you know, Wigner's involvement, Bohm's theory, the development of Everett. It's just a wonderful source of uh, a you know, wonderful resource. Um, but I agree completely. I don't. I don't think Wigner, you know, had any interest in or, or knew very much about phenomenology. And I think, in a way, it's really frustrating because I think it's you know he's to blame for why we haven't appreciated what London and Bauer were really trying to do. I think he appropriated their work, and then it, when 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 he was criticised and Marganau was criticised, they were kind of uh, folded up into that criticism and nobody bothered to look at their work more closely. And I think that was a great, that was a great shame. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, thank you very much, um, everybody for being here for this session. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you, you have for joining us. It, it has been a terrific session. Uh, we are looking forward to Wayne's one, which is going to be in the middle of November. So if you now you want revenge and want to come, <laughs> you are very much welcome. Um, and well, thank you, everybody. I, I think you. some some of the follow of the fellows here have some follow ups and they will send you emails. So they will stock your inbox. Um, thank you, everybody. And thank you. Thank you, so thank you very much thank for you. coming. Thank you so much. It was our pleasure. Thank you. Sorry, Take nice. care. Bye thank now. You. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.